Hello darlings, I'm Shara Elise, the founder of online storytelling platform Girls Will Be Boys and this is Say It With Your Chest, a podcast which aims to shine light on the corners of important conversations which are so often missed out of the media or seen as taboo. This Girls Will Be Boys podcast offers you an opportunity to enter different people's worlds, share unfiltered conversations and encourage our guests to say it with their chest. I'm black, I'm Muslim, I'm part of the LGBTQ community, I'm bisexual. You know, I grew up in care and I'm a woman. Those layers are so crazy. When and if I ever do see my mum, she sees me as a strong black woman who knows where they come from Mm. and why they came from there and what their purpose is. First of all, I think they don't think disabled people have a sexuality. (laughs) We very much do. (laughs) So today I'm here with the captivating Toby. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Toby Green Adenowo. I am 29 and I do dance and I advocate for people in the foster care system. I also you know, try to make changes within the TV industry so that there are more conversations that are intersectional. Mm, I feel like there's so much I want to like talk to you about because (laughs) even just then, like before we started recording, we was already getting into things. So, I mean, we can start off by what I wanted to initially talk to you about. So this episode, I was inspired by the fact that there weren't many conversations around race, identity and the care system. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you grew up in foster care. How long were you in the care system for? So I was was ushered into the foster care system at the age of three months old. um, And I left care at 17. Okay. Yeah. Wow, it's quite a big... Most of my life. Yeah. My entire life. Yeah. And were your foster parents black? Um, I had three foster carers that were black. The rest were white. I had um, 18 different foster homes that I went to. And in between that time, you know, I broke quite a lot of bones. In my entire life, I've broken 78 bones. Wow. Yeah. And I'm only 29. Wow. Okay. So for anyone who's just listening to this podcast and isn't watching right now, uh, would you mind saying what your disability is? Yeah. So I'm a full-time wheelchair user and I have something called osteogenesis imperfecta type three, which is the most severe type. And it means that I've got brittle bones. I break bones really easily and the bones do not form back Um, the same way. So osteo is obviously bones. Genesis is from the beginning. And imperfecta basically means an imperfection in the bones. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, whenever I break, I never break um, and heal the same way again. So most of my limbs are bent or um, extremely thin or extremely fragile. Right, and you were born with this? Yeah, um, I was born born with it from, yeah, from the very beginning. Nobody in my family has this condition and anybody in the world can end up with a child with brittle bones. Wow, okay. Yeah. And, I mean, you've been in foster care, like you had been in foster care since you could remember then. Yeah. So when do you feel like you were first made aware that you were quote-unquote different? <laughs> um... I would say quite early. I was a very, very wise young lady, a um, little girl. At like, I would say four years old, I was quite aware of like um, my responsibility in my, my home with my mum. Mm. My mum is from Nigeria, so I'm Nigerian. Both my parents are from Nigeria. Um, she came here to, you know, basically study um, nursing and had me and didn't know she was pregnant with me. Right. Um, and essentially they thought that she was abusing me because I was breaking bones quite often. And so they assumed that it was actually my mother doing it. And brittle bones is quite rare. So nobody, it wasn't known, especially in 1992, it, mm. wasn't, it wasn't known that this was a condition that also affects POC. Because I think a lot of... Um, white 
children with brittle bones, it was known, but in terms of the POC community, it was it wasn't it wasn't known. So yeah, um, ultimately I ended up in care. My mum ended up with schizophrenia. She was very very poorly, and so that's why I had to keep going in and out of the foster care system. Wow, I'm just like you. It's crazy. <laughs> That's a story in a whole. Mm. So yeah, I mean, you were obviously aware from early, from Very early, early yeah. that I mean, when I said quote unquote different, mm. obviously the world is not built for people with disabilities, but it's also not built for black people. Right. So when I asked, when were you made aware that you were different? Which thing were you referring to? I would say, my home life mm. was the m major thing because the children that I went to school with um, that were disabled, their parents taught, you know, treated them a little bit different than the way my parent, my mum did. And, and then on top of that, um, because I went to a mixed school, a mixed ability school, I kind of knew straight away that, um, I was not able to walk, I had to crawl, or I had to be in a chair. So I was quite aware from like four, you know, four or five, that I couldn't play the same way as other people. I also, when I get home, I, I don't have the same treatment as other people. Um, one of the major things was my mum never really allowed my wheelchair to be in the house, so I would always have to crawl. Um, she didn't really accept that I had a disability. So I was very, I was, yeah, I was taught to be aware quite young. Mm. And what, what about your blackness? Yeah, even my blackness, um, definitely. I knew that I came from an African household and then it wasn't really, African people were not embraced. It was more of a Caribbeans um, were more embraced, I would say. So I knew by the way I spoke or the way I ate my food or the types of food I was eating was very different to the kids at my school. And so I would try to assimilate and I would try to, you know, be a part of, of that. Mm. Um, but I knew I was different because of what I was doing at home. Mm. Which part of your identity do you feel like was the most, uh, was seen as the biggest problem being in the care system? My disability, mm. I think I've always had, yeah, that's been always the prominent thing um, everyone else makes, especially back then, the the way disabled people were tr taught uh, or um, treated in even, in even in the school system was very different um, and at times would be segregated or, you know, they would try to encourage us to be together maybe on a sports day or something like that. But in terms of being in care, when I was in the foster care homes, um, like my first early memories, you know, my mum taught me how to bathe myself, for example, or whatever, just to make sure that whenever I was sent to a foster home, and um, they're dealing with other kids, I'm able to be independent and do things for myself as well, rather than having to rely on other people. Mm. Um, again, at a very young age, um, any foster home that I was in, I would kind of be left to my own devices um, and not really be given the proper tools uh, to thrive. Mm. Do you feel like you were basically robbed of being a child? Most definitely. I think that, you know, I had to defend myself a lot of times. I had to uh, grow up super quick and have to be aware of my surroundings, um, and learn to speak up and advocate for myself um, at such a young age and understand how the UK system works and what it's designed for. And I very quickly learned that if I don't do something for myself, I'm not gonna get anywhere. Mm. What parts of that having been your experience do you feel like you've, as a care leaver, are, or have had a positive impact on who you are and mm. have a negative impact on who you are today? I think one of the positive things is a lot of the skills that I've learned throughout my life, being in care, has made me such a resilient young person. Mm. And I think that it's made me um, have to figure out 
how to have uh, or to demand and to make sure that I get the very best and sometimes provide others with the same information. And essentially that's like my job now um, to support, to make sure any room that I go into um, that I can bring those same skills, being able to talk in front of a room of adults, grown adults at such a young age. It taught me to be confident. Mm. Um, and also I would say the negatives to that is that unfortunately for people in foster care, they're just not given any help afterwards. Mm. Um, they're not given any healing tools mm. afterwards. And there's a massive gap for disabled and people with mental health um, disabilities. They are not given uh, the correct provisions to transition from the young uh, young people, like um, the care leavers, they call them care leavers, yeah. to adulthood. Mm. Um, and I am still behind compared right. to the other people in the same age group as me. They are much more advanced in terms of understanding, getting grasps of things like bills or knowing how to fight for your rights or to, you know, these skills that you would generally kind of grasp from your parents mm. and from being in a stable home. But because there was no stability there, it kind of takes some time to find your feet and find a way to kind of like be settled. Yeah. 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 I mean, you've mentioned a few things already, but what other things do you feel like the care system failed you on? I would say they didn't keep me safe until now like i don't feel safe and i'm going through a safeguarding thing at the moment and so this has been an ongoing thing that people who are vulnerable like myself are not taken seriously especially the fact that i'm black mm. i'm black i'm muslim i'm part of the lgbtq community i'm bisexual you know i grew up in care and i'm a woman those layers are so crazy and so learning my identity was always a really tricky thing and having the connection with my birth family there was such a disconnect mm. like there wasn't any they tried but at the end of the day majority of the system is run and you know arranged by white people, they don't have the incentive to make sure that you are a successor, mm. which is the reason why most people in care end up homeless or on drugs or in the prison system, mm -hmm. in gangs, etc. I'm very lucky, but however, you know, I early on when I got kicked out of foster home, out of my last foster home, at 17, I was put at huge risk, huge risk. You know, they allowed me to be around alcoholics, drug addicts, and I had to rely on them to eat. And so it took me a long time to get out of that system and to be able to move away. I now live in quite an affluent area. I've made, you know, now become like the first disabled person to work with MTV and all these other things. So amazing. Yeah, like, so, you know, my struggle as such has also made me quite a, like, a powerful force, mm -hmm. which is what they're quite scared of, because it's like, we're going to have to be forced to change. Right. Right, but at the moment, they're plain sailing. They don't have anything that, can rock the boat mm. but the moment I can stand on my two feet and make a business out of changing things and making sure that you know the voices like mine are heard mm -hmm. it's gonna definitely change the game. How did you manage to get into what you're doing now? So I started off uh, volunteering for something called Speaker Box which is like a youth-led program of young people in Southwark Council so we did like magazines, we changed some policies. So for example, young people used to be moved in bin bags from foster home to foster home rather than suitcases. Wow. Obviously you can imagine that knocks somebody's confidence down. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been part of programs to make change. I've always been somebody who 
even though my home life was really trash, I've always like, whenever I left the house, you know, I always put myself into something. So I was training for, when I was 15, roughly around that time, I say was when I started to like really start my career. So way before wow. Instagram, yeah, <laughs> way before it was cool to do it. Like I did it because I had to, I wanted to, mm. and I felt it was necessary. I lived um, near Brighton and I started a, I was part of a board that was, you know, a program for, it's called BME YPP, Black Minority Young People's Project. Okay. So it would essentially make a space where young people who are either from the foster care system or who are refugees or whatever, have a space to eat their food, to enjoy music together and to enjoy each other's cultures. And so I absolutely love that. And that's where it all began. Um, I also volunteered to um, look after young people with special needs, uh, learning disabilities. I started that job at like 13. Yeah, so I've always been a hard worker, mm -hmm. paid or not. I knew that I had a purpose mm -hmm. and I knew that I wanted to make sure something was left behind when I when I go, mm. essentially. Yeah, I wanted to touch on something that you mentioned earlier about identity. How do you feel like you have managed to form your identity without having the support of, you know, like a family or uh, just, just like the general things that most people have? Mm. How do you feel like you found your way with being proud to be black, being proud to be Muslim, being proud to be queer? Yeah. It's been a journey. <laughs> it didn't happen overnight. I think I used to have quite racist foster carers mm. and I lived with them. Mm. So all the bigots that you see on the street, I lived with them. Mm. I could not escape. A lot of young people f run away from their foster homes. Mm. And one of the things I always say to young people is, I can't run, I have to stay there um, and I have to face the music. And so that was one of the th first things that kind of made me uh, learn a bit more about my identity. So I would often put, you know, play hip hop music. I would often, as much as they hated it, I did not care. <laughs> it's like, I'm listening to Afrobeat. <laughs> I'm going to listen to my bashments. And if you don't like it, the door, <laughs> literally. So I've always been very much like, if you don't like it, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not for you, so it's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think I kind of like, I learned that from quite a young age because I like dance mm -hmm. and dance coincides with music. Mm -hmm. And so dance and music made me quite confident. Mm -hmm. It made me feel like you there's nothing you can say or do. I can get in my wheelchair, out of my wheelchair and dance, and do what I want to do. And so that started off my identity. And then when I figured that out, I stopped training for the Paralympics and I just went for it and I left Brighton. Mm -hmm. I left the foster home that I was in, which was quite cushy and nice. And I was living a good life there. I was going to a really good school, but I wanted to make, I wanted to make a future for myself. Right. And so I wanted to also reconnect with my identity. So I wanted to live somewhere near Peckham because I knew that was sort of the area that my mom was and me and her grew up before, you know, she sadly went missing when I was like 10. I haven't seen her in almost 20 years. So since then I promised myself that when when and if I ever do see my mom, uh, she sees me as a strong black woman who knows where they come from mm. and why they came from there and what their purpose is. And so uh, moved to London by myself, as I was uh, 16 and I lived with this uh, black foster family, they were so Leonian, and they couldn't quite grasp that I was disabled and so self-assured um, and, and so like willing to do what I can to understand my food and my culture and my language and all of the, those amazing things. So it's, it's taken time and then the pandemic made me kind of reconnect with my Muslim side, mm -hmm. um, with my religion and be proud of the name that I have. My middle name is Rafiat. That's a Muslim name. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I started to embrace that. I also came out at the same time. 
Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I told my foster, f um, no, not my foster family, my uh, carers. So I rely on carers that look after me day to day and help me to, you know, shower and all of the other things day to day. And so they are Muslim, they're full hijabis. And I told them, I am queer, I'm a bisexual woman, but I also love Allah. Um, if you're happy with that, then I'm happy with that. Mm. And so, yeah, um, now I feel free. I feel like I can finally, I feel like I'm fully myself now. And I feel like I fully understand every facet of me, which is quite honorable considering I'm only 29. Most yeah. people take a long time for mm. that, you know? Yeah, you said that your family the black foster family that you were with were confused yeah. as to how you could be. <laughs> right, so what do you feel like are some of the common misconceptions of you and your identity? Well, first of all, I think they don't think disabled people have a sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> we very much do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think because I was quite comfortable with boys and girls, they were kind of like, yeah, they often called me the devil, but I didn't care. I don't know why, I just, I'm not really, I'm scared, but I'm not scared. It's like the fearless lion, almost. Like, inside me, I am terrified, but I continue to just, like, stand, you know? Mm. Or sit, whatever. <laughs> you get what I mean? <laughs> but I just, I wear my crown, essentially. And so, yeah, I think the misconceptions is that, yeah, sexuality, they don't think that we have any type of sexuality, style, in terms of like wearing nice clothes, dabbling in makeup, dabbling in fashion, wanting to look good, knowing the best perfumes, all of that sort of stuff. Mm. At such a young age, I was always interested in, you know, the whole package. And yeah. so um, I just knew I wanted to make change. And in order to do that, when I go into a room, I wanted to res be respected fully and feel proud uh, first for myself, and then hopefully others would feel proud of themselves, um, and their identity. And then also being plus size is another thing that I would always be, you know, African people can be quite harsh when you are either very slim or very, or very big. Mm -hmm. And if you're confident with that, it can be very confusing for them. Mm. And so that's another sort of identity I kind of took on as a big, a beautiful brown lady who has every curve, every inch of them is just seeping with confidence. And so, yeah, uh, those identities I have always not been ashamed of mm. at all. Mm, I know you obviously have like several layers of marginalization. Yeah. And I know that as much as we can do for ourselves and our, and you know to believe in ourselves it still doesn't mean that we're not going to get knocked down by the world and mm -hmm. the way that the systems are and the way that it's set up for us and i know that you posted um a video about your mental health recently yeah what do you feel like is lacking in support for you and your mental health i think the system that we currently all are using, the NHS, the police, the government, X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, is not created for even European people, white people, even they struggle. So if you can imagine how it can be when you are black, mm -hmm disabled and all these other things, it confuses them. And like I said, because I'm very self-assured self and it it's like they can't grasp that I'm educated and smart, but also dealing with mental health. And so the system is very binary. Mm. It's like, it's very regimented. It doesn't allow for wiggle room and um, it doesn't recognize that you can be disabled and have mental health, right? Mm. And so for me, I'm not being, I'm, I'm literally not being supported enough at all. I had a meeting this week actually with my mental health team, I had a review and yeah, honestly, it, it I have to always 
stick up for myself and it's exhausting mm. um, and to explain it to the average Joe is just like it's a hard pill to swallow mm -hmm. that the the world that we currently live in is quite dark at times mm. and doesn't respect or keep people like me safe and so right now yeah I'm in the midst of an investigation of my carer I'm happy to share that so at the moment my I had a carer that um, abused me and so they are being investigated however it's taken three or four years for anything to be done and that's the same with my mental health it's taken a long time for anything to be implemented mm. um, and so mentally right now I'm up and down I'm up and down um, it's been so difficult to want to even get up in the morning do anything be a part of the world uh, stand up on my wheels <laughs> <laughs> and still get out of the house I had I have agoraphobia right and depression and severe anxiety and uh, complex PTSD so all of these things, when you go to the NHS, it's usually set up for able-bodied people. Mm. Um, there aren't really therapists that can relate to being disabled. There aren't enough therapists that are disabled themselves. Mm. There aren't therapists that are queer themselves or enough of them. There are very, there are black uh, people now that are coming up doing therapy. However, Again, it's very, like... Few and far between. Yeah. Um, and even when I do go to them, I just find they can't relate to the added struggle of being disabled and black mm. and a care lever. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I can only really ever explore a certain part of me because mm. that's that's what's on, on offer at the moment in the world. I did something called Courage. It's called a, it's called Courage because it's basically a group for, it was made after the Black Lives Matter movement. And so it was there for black women and men to have some kind of therapy for eight weeks. Um, mm. And so that was still something yeah. and it has sort of helped. Um, all the other corners of me, I still feel very vulnerable mm. and I still sometimes feel very scared to leave my home, you know? Mm. When when you are able to not be debilitated by your mental health, what are the things you do that bring you joy? Dance, uh, YouTube videos. I love learning about the world and seeing so many different people. Social media in general is just a blessing in disguise when mm. I'm trapped in my home mm. and doing stuff like this as well. Mm. It brings me so much joy because I know whoever listens, they can, may not fully resonate to being disabled. They may resonate maybe to my queerness. They may resonate to being a woman. They just may not even be any of those things, but want to listen. And so that brings me a lot of joy. That brings me a lot of purpose. It makes me feel like I'm doing something good. Mm. Oh, I'm happy that yeah. this was on the list. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Especially because you said, like, sometimes you can't always get out the house. So um, yeah, I'm exactly. very grateful that yeah. you made it out here. <laughs> and I wanted to give you an opportunity of reclamation. And I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah. What's one apology that you've made in the past that you would like to take back? My apology I would like to take back is when uh, my, my final foster carer kind of kicked me out and I apologised to them and I sat down Christmas dinner with them just so that I wasn't alone and I would like to take that back because they knew full well what they were doing mm. and I didn't do anything wrong and I knew I didn't do anything wrong and I knew that what I stood for was more than even myself um, but at the time I felt guilty which a lot of people do when they have anxiety and things they think you know oh my god why why did I say that why did I do that mm. however I now I I know I'm gonna take that back <laughs> fully yeah, yeah amazing well thank you so much for being on this episode I'm, I feel like people will will learn so much and 
I just I really enjoy talking to you. you <laughs> Is there anything that you want to plug or? Yeah. Um, so I created something called uh, Disabled Power um, Network TV. And the purpose of it is to create a space for queer and other intersectional disabled people and for able-bodied people to learn from and to figure out how they can find more of us um, so that we can be included in more conversations. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely something that I would urge people to go and you can either donate or just follow um, and Hopefully in the future, I will be able to post, um, you know, content on there that will kind of expose a bit more about what's really going on for the disabled community and how Black Lives Matter and other movements can really be extended to the most vulnerable first. Mm, yeah, because it's like you mentioned before we were recording about if we sort of focus on the most vulnerable, mm then that's the best, the best way to, exactly. but obviously most of the time it's not the case, but yeah. 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 And the other thing I would say is follow my page, Tough Cookie T, uh, T-O-U-G-H, cookie and a, a T-E-E. -E. Um, on there, I, I share my dancing and poetry sometimes, spoken word. Um, I haven't done spoken word in a while because digging deep can be a bit painful. I think I've got a few things coming up soon. Well, thank you so much for everything that you do. And again, for being here with me. Of course. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Say It With Your Chest. If you're loving the conversations that we're having, make sure to rate us five stars and to leave a review wherever you're watching or listening right now. Make sure to follow, like, and subscribe to all things Say It With Your Chest and make sure you follow Girls Who Are Boys on Instagram and TikTok to know when their next episode will drop. See you next time.